Uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name's John Clark. I'm the uh, professor and head of the Department of Anatomy here at King's. Uh, so half of my job um, is to look after all the teaching requirements that the anatomy department uh, supplies to our undergraduates and make sure that that's you know, at the right level and quality and content to keep you all excited and happy. Um, and I enjoy doing that. Um, but the other half of my job is to run a research laboratory up on the fourth floor, in fact, of this building. And the purpose of my uh, chat with you over the next 20 minutes is just to introduce to you the kind of research that goes on behind the teaching scene. So any university worth its salt uh, will only maintain its international reputation if the large majority of people who teach your undergraduates are at the cutting edge of research. Okay, and, I, and I'm just going to give you a flavour of what my particular laboratory does uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, primary biomedical research so that you can get an idea about uh, what interesting things are going on. Um, I'm not being put forward as the best person in research. I just happen to be available this afternoon. And I'm going to briefly uh, plunge you into a bit of darkness. So, if you listen to lots of the uh, popular science programs on television and you listen to Professor Brian Cox a lot, uh, uh, you, you'll be uh, um, perhaps under the impression that the really exciting edge of, of, of research these days is looking out into deep outer space and trying to work out the origins of the universe um, and everything. And that's certainly really important. But what I would like to impress upon you is that deep inner space uh, is actually also uh, really interesting and really important. So that deep outer space photograph, you know, was of the scales of billions of light years in terms of distance and time. And this image taken by my laboratory is a photograph um, at the other end of, the, of that, you know, dimensional scale. So the, the whole of this photograph, in reality, is of, of uh, the inside of a tiny little embryo, and it's about half a millimeter from here to here. And the things that look like they might be stars are tiny, tiny little um, intracellular organelles called centrosomes. So your body is made up of many billions of cells, and inside each cell, uh, there are many hundreds of little proteins and organelles, and one of those is called the centrosome, and each of these little green or yellow spots is an intracellular organelle called a centrosome. Um, and, it, and we're working on the hypothesis that that tiny little bit of a cell is really important in generating your body shape. Okay. And you might get a hint that I might be right here, because this little bit of the embryo is a vertebrate embryo that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second. This little bit of the embryo, you can see that there's some level of organization in this embryo along this line, where all of these little centrosomes are kind of lining up in comparison to the distribution of these spots in other parts of the embryo. And that bit of the embryo there is the bit that's um, going to become the backbone. It would be, you know, contribute to the backbone that's holding your torso up right now. And you can see that these centrosomes are more organized than they, in the, the embryonic backbone than they are elsewhere. So what my laboratory is really interested in is generating shape. Um, and you sort of might think, uh, well, generating shape in biology, that's not really very interesting. That sounds a little bit tricky, uh, you know, maybe slightly trivial. But I would like to persuade you that it's not. Um, it has a fancy name, morphogenesis. That's the study of shape generation in biology. That's what my lab loves to do. And here's an example of why it's really important. So this is a, um, a view of a human brain cut down the midline, separating left from right-hand sides. This is the right-hand side of a human brain. You can see it has a very complicated shape. 
Um, and that shape is terribly uh, stereotyped from individual to individual. If I were to cut every one of your brains in half, they'd all look like that. Okay, I'm not going to do it. But they would. Um, and the generation of that shape, therefore, is under very tight control. And it's all made in the very early days and weeks of the uh, vertebrate embryo, if it's a human embryo, over a matter of weeks. If that shaping uh, process goes wrong, you get very distressing uh, fetal abnormalities. And one that most of you will probably have heard about is illustrated in this uh, diagram over here. So here's a newborn baby. You probably can't quite see the details here, but it has a nasty red lump on the base of its uh, um, spinal, uh, uh, spinal column uh, down here. And that's uh, spina bifida. I'm sure you will have, have heard of that. It happens at about one in a thousand frequency in humans today. It's a very frequent birth abnormality. And it's a problem with the embryo not being able to develop the right shape that normally covers up the spinal cord during development. So in that part of that unfortunate uh, uh, um, uh, baby seen here in reality down here that is the nasty scar on a baby the baby's head would be over here that exposure of spinal cord uh, results from the embryo not being able to generate the right shape I don't want to have you in darkness forever Okay, and it happens not only right down there close to your bottom, but occasionally and much more distressingly, it happens up in the head end where all of the skull becomes exposed and the brain becomes exposed uh, to the outside world. And it's very, very distressing and I wouldn't dare show you a, an equivalent photograph of that. So that's one reason why shape is important. And here's another reason why shape is important. So if we look at the level of individual cells in the human brain. Here, these bright lights that we can see here, these are individual large neurons that sit in the outer layers of your brain in your cortex. These are called pyramidal uh, neurons because they have a slightly pyramidal triangular shape. And, and, and you can see that these, these individual cells have very long processes uh, uh, pointing out in all different directions. And um, neuronal shape, the main cell type that enables your brain to function in any kind of reasonable way, um, is a, an amazing example of how an individual cell has to develop a very particular shape. Otherwise, your brain simply won't work properly. And I can help you understand why that's really important easily, I think. So here's two neurons that I've just drawn on the right-hand diagram here. Here's the cell body of this neuron. It has a couple of uh, little short processes on its surface called dendrites, whose job it is to receive information from other neurons. And then coming off the cell body, it has one long process called an axon. And that axon's job is to take electrical information off to a distant part of the nervous system. And where it meets this other neuron, drawn here, you can see that the axon coincides in space with the short dendritic processes of this cell, and that enables them to make synaptic connections at that point. However, if this cell doesn't develop the right shape, say it develops this shape, it's exactly the same neuron, but now its dendrites are not pointing down, they're all pointing up, then you, you, it's just obvious this neuron can never talk to this neuron here because it's in the wrong position in space. And it's in the wrong position in space because the shape of this cell is incorrectly specified. So my lab is trying to uh, do, understand those two things. How do you ge generate the total shape of the brain and how do you generate the shape of individual neurons in the brain itself. And I think that's really important. I might have sort of persuaded you that it is important, but you actually don't have to take my word for it, because the Wellcome Trust, which is one of the largest funders of biomedical science in the UK right now, has just uh, given my lab uh, two million pounds to look at those two questions in detail. So it's, uh, we think it's an important uh, process. <coughs> 
And in order to have a chance of, of understanding how shape of the brain and shape of individual cells is generated, what we need to do is we need to be able to look at what individual cells are doing in the embryo during development. So that's quite a tall order to look at, you know, a cell is, you know, maybe a tenth of a millimeter across if it's a large cell. How are we going to see what one of those cells is doing amongst the many millions of cells that exist in the embryo? That's what the challenge for us is. But here are some examples that might persuade you that we can do it and that it's pretty interesting. So what my lab does, I'll show you how in a minute, or I'll tell you how in a minute, is we make uh, time-lapse movies of fluorescently labeled cells, individual cells, inside intact embryos uh, as they're alive and healthy and intact. So, so this is a movie, and I've, my people in my lab, not me, uh, have injected some fluorescent traces into a small number of cells. Uh, in red, we've got a fluorescence tracer that marks the nucleus, where all the DNA, the blueprint of development uh, uh, exists. And in green, we're labeling the membrane, the outer membrane of the cell, so we can see their shape. And I'm just going to play this movie, because it's fun. Um, and because it just, look how active these cells are. So during development, here's a crawly cell. You know, it's sending out lots of micro spikes as it crawls across, it's crawling across the surface of the developing brain in this case. It's an irritating cell, so I've just moved it out of the way. And this cell underneath it, slightly more boring looking, is just pushing out one little process here. That little process that it's pushing out from its cell body here, that's going to be the axon that eventually will contact onto another neuron and make a synapse and start the beginnings of circuit development. So, so it's just kind of quite fun to make these movies, and it's really instructive. They're amazingly dynamic uh, uh, um, uh, cells in vertebrate embryos. Um, and by making movies, by studying a single cell over time, it turns out you really reveal processes in biology that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Just if you took a single photograph, uh, you just wouldn't know what happened five seconds before or five seconds after. It really reveals new things. And that's kind of illustrated in this movie here. So this is an embryonic cell. It's in the spinal cord region. And this cell is going to become a neuron. Now, I showed you, I told you a couple of moments ago that, that neurons are famous for having two types of processes. On their cell bodies, they have a small number of rather short processes called dendrites. And they have one long process, generally. It's not a real rule. But often, they just have one long process called an axon. Um, and that's what a neuron's shape is. But by making movies, we've shown actually that neurons have a third process, a, th a third type of process that no one imagined that they would have. And, and those processes are here and here. Here's the cell body. So these long processes here turn out to be temporary. We don't quite know what their job is yet, but I'll show you that they're present. Well, you can see they're present now. If only I could play the movie, I'd be really happy. There we go. So, th so here's our cell becoming a neuron. And look, it's sucked in those long processes. It's gone into a kind of frenzied activity. And then it looks like a balloon again. And it pushes out this long axonal process that I talked to you here. So this is the process that will be this long axonal process. Um, but those first initial processes that it threw out are completely withdrawn. So in, in you know, a few of the critical frames from that movie, here's our young neuron. These are our mystery processes, the third type of process that nobody really thought would exist. They're thrown out. They're quite substantial in terms of size and time. Uh, um, they are transient. They only exist for a certain amount of time. And they're sucked back into the cell. So this is the same cell, no longer has these processes. Now it's remodeling its shape. 
in a very dramatic way and eventually its cell body here goes very quiet in terms of process development and it throws out one little axon here and several hours later it's going to throw out dendrites too. So, so you would never know that was happening if you, unless you can make a movie of it. And that's what my lab does. How do we do that? You absolutely, of course, can't do that in a human embryo. Uh, um, for some reason the lights don't work. And you can't do it in a, in a mammalian embryo at all, actually. You know, mammals, the embryos of mammals develop inside the womb. You can't get a camera close enough or a microscope close enough inside the belly of the mother. But we make these movies in this little tropical fish, which is a zebrafish. You might have zebrafish uh, in your fish tanks at home. You can buy them just in a normal uh, pet suppliers. The adults are about, you know, three centimeters long. Uh, we're not really interested in the adults, apart from the fact that they make embryos. And this is a, uh, you know, a big picture of, of what a fish embryo looks like. It's fantastic for us because you know, they're laid by the mother, fertilized externally by the dad, and then we can watch the development of these embryos under the microscope without interfering in any way. So this is a completely healthy, living embryo. And this is a movie of that embryo, 24 hours, stuck under the microscope. These are the cells that are going to make the embryo up here. This is the yolk that keeps those cells happy and, and, and full of nutrient. And you can see those cells that are going to make the embryo. They generate interesting shapes. And eventually, those cells that are making interesting shapes, within 24 hours, fantastically quickly, they begin to make a shape that you could sort of guess which bit of the fish they're going to make. So this is the head end of the fish. That's the eye. This is the brain of the fish. You can see these kind of chevron-shaped uh, structures down here. That probably reminds you of the chevron-shaped white meat that you eat if you have uh, fish and chips. And that is. That's the, 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 the meat that makes the fish swim. And this is the tail of the embryo down here. So they're, they're fantastically happy at being stuck under a microscope for 24 hours. Uh, they're very transparent, which is great for microscopy. Um, and they make a brain in a very short amount of time. 24 hours after fertilization, I can tickle this embryo on its side, and it'll begin to swim out of the way. OK, so they're very interesting uh, uh, um, animals. Do they have any relevance to human embryology, you might ask, and that would be a pretty good question. Um, and uh, I wouldn't study them if they didn't, is the <laughs> NAF answer. Um, but if you were to look at a fish embryo brain uh, at an early stage in development, at the stages we look, you just wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a human embryo brain and a fish embryo brain. Structurally, they're the same. They make the same bits of the brain. They make a forebrain. They make a midbrain. They make a brain stem to keep them breathing. They make a spinal cord that makes them swim or walk if you're not a fish. So uh, the, the, kind of the, the, the basic plan of how you make a brain is in the fish. Of course, it makes a differently shaped brain in the end to a human, but it's very, very similar. OK, so we do all of our experiments on fish. This enables us uh, to look inside that embryo at individual cells in a completely intact and happy embryo. We can't ask them if they're happy, but none of them have ever complained. Um, and I'm just going to show you some of the things that we can do. So here is an individual neural stem cell. This is one of the cells that will generate the brain of the fish. It's, you can't see it, but it's got hundreds of neighbors on either side. You can't see those because we haven't filled them up with fluorescent protein. Uh, so here's our one cell. Here's its nucleus in the middle. We, in red, we've labeled the membrane of the cell. And in green, there's not much green there. But in green, you can probably see one, two, three, four, five little spots of green protein. This is a protein that we know is critical 
for the brain to acquire the correct shape. So now we can watch not only what this cell does, but we can watch how each of these little spots of protein behave during a few hours of development. This is a neural stem cell, so it's going to divide. There it is dividing. One cell becomes two, two nuclei. And it, the daughters of that division have a rather interesting shape. And importantly, you can see these little bright green spots here. This is where that brain shaping protein called PARD3 goes to in these cells. So it turns out this protein is not only uh, important for making the shape of the brain, but it is localized very specifically within individual cells. So we have to understand not only what a cell does, but what individual proteins within cells do. And that's a nice example uh, of looking into an embryo and watching both the outside of cells and the inside of cells at high resolution. I started off my talk by showing you this image of deep inner space, where I told you each of these little spotty uh, um, uh, um, organelles that you can see here is called a centrosome. And I suggested to you that the organization of centrosomes might be interesting in terms of building the shape of the backbone in that case. Uh, we also know that the organization of these little organelles called centrosomes is really important for building the shape of the brain. And this is one, uh, um, not a movie, it's just a, a series of uh, images that help us believe that hypothesis. So on the left, we have a young brain, intermediately old brain, old brain here, so three time points. Ooh, that's scary. And then, um, <laughs> uh, so what you can tell is that the distribution of these bright green spots changes from young brain to old brain. So here the distribution of bright green spots is very homogeneous. They're well spread in the developing brain. And by this point over here, no idea why that's happening. And by this time point over here, the, the, those centrosomes have moved to the middle of the brain. And the middle of the brain is where you're going to generate cerebrospinal fluid, which, uh, which inflates your brain and gives it shape. And what's really interesting is that we can see that centrosomes become more organized over time. And it's only when the centrosomes coalesce along the midline of the embryonic brain that this protein, which I told you before, don't, I'm sure you don't remember the name, Party 3 this protein is what shapes the brain. And it only gets to the midline after the centrosomes have got there first. Okay. So moving the centrosomes to this midline position seems to be critical to generating this line of our brain-shaping protein, PARD3. So this is the hypothesis that we're working on. Can we disrupt centrosomes? If we disrupt centrosomes, will we alter the position of this protein? And then will that change the shape of our embryo brain? And that's what we're working on right now. I don't have the answers to those really important questions. Um, but what we want to do to do that is, is to take away the centrosomes. So, you know, these are perhaps one micron. They're in size, they're about a thousandth of a millimeter across. Getting rid of those from inside a cell, inside a living embryo, is quite a challenging thing to do. But what we're aiming to do, and we're beginning to have some success, is that we're using a very small laser beam to blast that centrosome into non-existence. And we can explode centrosomes now under fancy microscope. And, and what we will test is, if in the absence of those little organelles, does our brain-shaping protein get to the right place? So that's what we're currently aiming to do. Um, this is a, just, a, just another reminder about essentially how amazing this is. It, it kind of it impresses me every time we do it. So here are two cells inside the embryo brain. Each of these cells is less than one-tenth of a millimeter long. And yet inside of these cells, we can see these little bright bits of protein that might be a thousandth of a millimeter long. 
and we can watch how these proteins move within cells, within an intact, happily living embryo. Um, and uh, this enables us to test how cells generate shape effectively. I don't need to tell you the details, but I think it's you know, kind of impressive to think that you can, you can work at that level of resolution. So what do you need to work at that l level of resolution? The first thing you need is a good team. So I have a good team up in my lab upstairs. This is a, a, a shot of uh, my team. And you, the characteristic of all these people who really do the experiments is their age. So doing science, doing exciting biomedical science is a young person's game. Okay, by the time you get to my age, you're past it, apart from being able to work at a microscope. But, you know, all of these people here who are doing the work, you know, they're all 30 or under. Uh, and some of them, like Claire and Antonino and Andy, are about 30. They're postdoctoral research scientists. You know, they've done about six or more years uh, research in a lab, they're becoming independent, soon they're going to be applying to get their own jobs as lecturers or whatever. So, so we've got some of those in the lab, then we've got some, some uh, technicians in their sort of mid-30s, uh, early 30s, sorry. Um, and then we've got um, a variety of, of graduate students, people who've just got their BSCs, decided they want to do a PhD, which will take them three to four years of working in the lab, like Becky uh, uh, down here. And then we've got uh, undergraduate students. So a critical part of my team are the undergraduate students who do their final year project in my lab. So come to year three. If you come to King's, uh, you know, like all good universities, part of your final year will be to join a research team and do primary research. Help us answer questions that we don't know the answer to. Uh, 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 and so uh, uh, Jenny and Helena uh, uh, and Louise uh, are all in my, uh, have all been in my lab now. Uh, they spend, you know, maybe three months in my lab joining in the primary research. Uh, and they make a really significant contribution. They, they work, you know, alongside the permanent research uh, staff in my lab. The other thing, apart from a good team, is that you need a fancy microscope. You need a sophisticated microscope to do this kind of experiment. This is a rather boring photograph of a pretty amazing microscope. The microscope sits at the back here. The compute computational elements of the microscope sit here. And underneath this desk are four big lasers that enable us to use laser light to be able to image those cells that I showed you before. So this is a confocal microscope. Uh, uh, it enables us to take beautiful images of individual cells over time in intact animals, in this case in intact embryos. Um, and in order to have this kind of machinery, you need a certain amount of cash. So this microscope costs about a quarter of a million pounds. We've got many of them sitting up on the fourth floor um, right now. And to be able to buy that kind of equipment, you need good support. You can get support from the research councils, the BBSRC and the MRC. MRC is the Medical Research Council. Uh, the Wellcome Trust funds us for this. And really critical that you should know, this microscope was bought for me by the school. So the school really supports you know, what we think is, is fundamental, cutting-edge uh, research. So that microscope, you know, does cost a quarter of a million quid. Um, who gets to use it? Well, all the permanent members of staff in my lab get to use it. But this deep inner space picture that I showed you at the start is made by Louise, who's my current undergraduate student in her third year. She'll get a BSc degree at the end of the year. She's doing a beautiful degree project where she's looking at the organization of centrosomes during uh, backbone development. So even as an undergraduate, you get access to, to really uh, uh, top-of-the-range machinery. Uh, this is a rather interesting movie, I think. Um, 
of, a, of an older zebrafish brain. And this is a movie that was made by uh, an undergraduate uh, dental student who got a bit bored with dentistry and he used to come to my lab just in his spare time when he wanted something interesting to do. So I let him use the microscope and he looked at the organization of a five-day-old fish embryo brain. He made this amazing movie. So in three dimensions, we can look at the organization of neurons in the brain. In blue, we can look at how synaptic connections are made in the brain by adding in a different antibody to a synaptic protein. And then we can look at what individual neurons are doing. So now in green, uh, Thomas has uh, imaged uh, individual neurons that we can see here, like balloons on strings. We can look at their axonal organization in three dimensions. So we can really understand what kind of a brain the fish makes. Um, and uh, he, Thomas just did that in his spare time, which is pretty remarkable. Do we think the quality of what we do is good? I think it really is good. This, I think, is good evidence for that. So here is Joseph Norris. He was the undergraduate project student in my lab. I think, uh, what year are we now? We are three years ago, 2011. And his project was so good, we thought we would enter it into the national competition. So the British Neuroscience Association run a competition each year for the top neuroscience undergraduate project uh, uh, of, for all of the UK. No idea why that happens. Um, and Joseph came second. So we gave him a good beating for coming second. Uh, but, but, none, but it was, you know, a fantastically high quality uh, piece of work uh, done just up on the fourth floor here. So we, can't, we, we think that uh, we allow our students, our undergraduates, to really do high quality research. You could read about this yourself. If you were to Google MRC Dev Neuro, you would come up with this web page, and if you were to click on research groups here or research here, you could click through, and you could really read about what all the different labs are doing, uh, demystifying brain function, growth, and disease. So that's really, you know, what as a, as a group we do. Thank you very much for listening. So this is me when I'm not doing research. I, my, I have great fun, you know, showing people real human brains and teaching uh, neuroanatomy. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>